everybody. Uh, welcome back to another live edition. I am terribly sorry for starting so late. I have no idea what's happening. There are technical glitches and hiccups happening since I pressed the start button or the go live button and I have no idea what's happening right now. So I am just winging it and I am praying that this stream is actually live and people can see it I, I i i don't know what's happening <laughs> i did some testing during the week i don't know if you guys caught that if not uh then this means nothing and i have failed you but regardless uh here we are i guess <laughs> welcome everybody to another exciting live stream edition of a week in geekdom geo here and yeah, another Fable Fridays, a weird one at that, Fable Fridays, where I talk about DC Comics or Vertigo's uh, classic Fable series, and I have with me Book 9 here to briefly discuss and review for you guys. So if anybody's tuning in, because uh, I know I killed the stream basically by starting so late, but if anybody's tuning in live... I would appreciate it if you could drop a comment in the uh, chat box. If not, it's all right. Don't worry about it. So, yeah, I finally uh, got through reading with this, and it's it's a mixed bag of emotions here on this book, so I'm really excited to talk about it. Uh, as always, uh, let me remind you that you can uh, subscribe to this channel for content like this, uh, where I talk about anime, manga, and comics if not you can follow me on social media and all that fun stuff so uh give me one quick second here and it should be yeah all right cool 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 perfect uh sure all right so fable fridays let's begin this whole thing right that's that's what you're here for <laughs> um let me take the dust jacket off. By the way, this is easily one of the coolest covers of the whole uh, set of deluxe oversized hardcovers right there. Uh, really cool stuff. And this one collects issues 70 all the way up to 82. So this is a chunky one. Uh, a chunky one. Uh, collecting the stories, War and Pieces, The Dark Ages, along with Skull Duggery and a couple one shots. So let's start talking about this book. If we take the dust jacket off, of course, you can see the uh, textus image right there. Looking pretty fantastic. Of course, Cinderella and uh, Boy Blue. And on the back over here, you get this really awesome scene with uh, the Emperor himself fighting off against Bigby. So it's all one epic splash page, if you will. Yeah, that glare. Sorry about that. So when we last left uh, Fables, when I was talking... By the way, I can't put the ticker at the bottom, but this is spoiler heavy. If you don't want me to spoil Fables, stop watching this video, go back, read the series, then come back. Don't worry about it. And uh, we can geek out over book nine. So a lot of cool things happen in this book. A lot of uh, shocking things happen. When we last left this story, we were getting ready for war. And before we can start that war, a couple things have to happen. And uh, we begin, of course, with some guest art, which I was not expecting from Nico uh, Henricon. I, I hope I said that right, uh, as, a, filling in, as a filling in as a guest artist. And it's not bad. I actually really liked it. It's very different from what you're used to. And it almost has this pulpy indie feel that's unlike what we've seen from Fable so far. And yeah, you could say, you could make the case, you know, it started out sort of as a, a high-profile indie series. But it, it definitely brings a different feel to the series, in my opinion. Not... A huge fan of it I, I I gotta admit I'm I like when we get consistent artwork and when you start throwing random guest artists it, it just throws me for a loop but that's just me personally but it's 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 good art it's just uh, very different than what I'm used to with uh, with the regular issues of fables so this is sort of the prelude to everything that's about to happen in this book. Uh, you know, here we have a meeting here on the farm. 
and the characters are discussing, you know, war is about to start, but you have an opportunity to leave to the Kingdom of Haven, but just be aware that you can't, even though it's not going to be your regular home, it's still different from the farm and being in the Monday uh, world, right? But at the same time, you're going to be constricted to that area because they haven't liberated, uh, you know, the um, uh, the kingdoms and all that stuff. So it's more or less the same thing. Either you stick in the farm with the Bundys or you go back uh, through Haven with Flycatcher. Of course, they would be stuck there. A lot of characters, uh, a lot of the animals, uh, animal fables are discussing that fact. Also... Uh, Boy Blue and uh, Rose Red are having uh, some feelings for each other, but <laughs> it um, boy our boy here is a little bit uh, clueless about the whole thing and hasn't necessarily expressed his true intentions or feelings towards her. And obviously she's had uh, quite a colorful past. Uh, Give me one quick second. John, thank you for joining. Let me see if I can pull this up. Um, okay, I... Anyways, whatever. <laughs> thank you for joining, John. Thank you so much. Um, here we have more. This was pretty cool, actually. Uh, let's see right there. The characters of Small Town discussing the same thing that I just mentioned about leaving... Uh, the farm and these two characters of course discussing their own relationship obviously boy blue is uh, has fallen for rose red but she doesn't really see it that way and it's more of a friend zone type situation which is going to bite them in the butt uh, later on in this book right emotionally speaking so after that we go into by the way I, I do want to mention all of the high-profile Fable Town uh, people discussing their war plans, if you will, what they're going to do. We don't really know, and as the story folds out, um, as the story plays out, sorry, we find what exactly they are planning and doing, which is pretty interesting. Uh, the next story is Skullduggery, which we follow. We're back with Mark Buckingham as Penciler, and we follow. Cinderella, who you know is a spy working for Fable Town. She was uh, trained, found and trained by Big Feet, and she's looking for a very important key item. And we find out as we read the story, one, Cinderella's an utter badass and one of my favorite characters. Two, she's actually there in Tierra del Fuego, uh, down in South America and Argentina, to rescue or deliver back to uh, Fable Town of course, our boy Pinocchio, who is going to switch sides. And as a result, we're going to get info uh, and seal that remaining gateway from uh, Tierra del Fuego that leads from the kingdom into uh, the Monday world, or our Earth, if you will. So it's a classic spy story retold through the usage of fables, and it is really really awesome she's such a great character and the way that obviously she can uh handle her way against uh the most formidable of foes and here we have hansel and after that which is just two issues uh we get the reintroduction of two characters that we met previously um and of course i'm referring to the wooden soldiers rotney and june course we saw them back i believe two hardcovers ago and now we see them uh back in action because pinocchio's back in town right so they're moving in to swipe him but uh pinocchio is their high profile target but he convinces them to uh, ditch geppetto and guard him instead so they acquired two key assassins as allies quote unquote <laughs> for fable town so that was pretty cool uh, as well. Love that. Man, I love, I, I grew accustomed to that. We get into the meat and bones of this hardcover. Voyage of the Sky Treader, uh, Chapter 1, War and Pieces. I'm not going to highlight every single page here. 
but basically War and Pieces is the start of the war. We see, uh, the, uh, I believe it was, what was the name of the ship? Uh, Sky of Baghdad, I, I think it was, the airship that they construct. You can see it right here with the Arabian Fables and Sinbad at the helm, piloting it with uh, Prince Charming uh, leading the way. And this is just really badass. You see the utter dominance uh, at the hands of these uh, fables when it comes to war. And they're fighting off against dragons and they're knocking them out of the sky. They're shooting everything in sight. And it's abundantly clear that they have the upper hand. The advantage is clear as day. You know, they've got the tactical advantage and the technological one. It was a huge mistake for the emperor's uh, troops to not be trained in modern combat, you know, out of fear that if guns, um, if the regular population would get their hands on guns, obviously, uh, they would just uh, use it against the empire. So that came back to bite them in the butt as well. And we see the results of uh, Fable Town's scheming and training uh, with all the different soldiers, pe uh, people or human fables and animals that weren't trained to do this. Uh, we're starting to see the uh, fruits of that labor. And, you know, obviously the bunker base of retreat with the last remaining beanstalk is being defended by Bigby Wolf, which will come into play at the end of the war. And, of course, the uh, giants right there. It's just a really interesting way to get a war comic filled with dark fantasy elements and with fable characters. And, you know, they try everything, but uh, the fables, they want to bombard uh, all the gateway points in uh, the Empire to block everybody's path and secure a victory. Unfortunately, uh, after a few successful attempts, you know there's going to be some hellish uh, retribution from the enemy. As you can see right here, they launch out an all-out dragon assault. Uh, it doesn't quite succeed, but it still uh, puts a strain on them because they're obviously doing this for the first time and they're being overwhelmed by so many foes. And the Emperor decides, because he's not in commune with Geppetto after what happened with the Haven incident and all the wooden soldiers with the uh, sacred trees and all that stuff, that power is gone. So Geppetto's just uh, grief struck and he doesn't really know what he's going to do. Uh, he's just uh, in, in des desperate mode and in shock. So the Emperor decides uh, to go all out and overwhelm the enemy, which is a tactic that you can use, I guess, when you know you're you're losing, but you have such a huge, uh, massive army that you can sacrifice all the grunts and just overwhelm them, uh, and eventually the enemy is going to run out of bullets and ammunition, and you can strike with what's left. Obviously, it's going to cost heavily into your uh, army and personnel, but uh, it, it is a tactic. It's not the best one, but that's what they're going with, right? Obviously, they can't compete against bombs and Gatling guns and all that stuff. So they go to overwhelm the enemy. Uh, and this is one of my favorite splash pages from the book. This utter insanity that is happening right there with all the dragons. This is uh, really badass, and the art is just, just perfectly encapsulates the horrors of war, but it does, it, it paints the picture so well, so beautifully with fable characters and such a vivid, vibrant uh, scenery that is, it, you feel how surreal it is. It's not obviously a war uh, like in our earth. You see the difference between the two. So I really like that on the artistic side of things. Obviously the way that they can do this uh, in, have such a successful network of uh, intel uh, you know Snow White is leading the intel from the Wolf Manor but they're using blue uh, blues power with the witching cloak to transport ammunition and soldiers food supplies all around between the various different uh, uh, fighting spots another strategic 
thing that they're doing is, of course, uh, they're going to use Sleeping Beauty's power, which I talked about way back at the start of Fable Fridays with book one and book two, and how they're using uh, her sleeping power by pricking her, which will cause the... By the way, supposedly this is one of the strongest spells. They've tried to break it and nobody's been successful it's that <laughs> overpowered so one of the uh secret weapons aside from the bombs and all that stuff is her uh, curse and once she pricks herself uh she's stationed at the empire's stronghold their main capital that curse will make everybody fall asleep including the emperor everybody and just release all the thorns and all that stuff and that is exactly what happens and let's see if I can find the, um, here they are right there, discussing that fact. Our boy Blue here, uh, when he leaves, that's the uh, cue for them to do their thing. And this was just brilliant. I mean, obviously they're in a heap of trouble because the whole capital is going to be surrounded by thorns. But you're knocking out your lead villain your antagonist your goal right there that is awesome and let's see here are the uh, thorns right there and where's oh here's a shot right there look at that the whole kingdom right there <laughs> in thorns asleep so war and pieces uh here we have the fire ship which unfortunately, uh, one of the other secret plans uh, from the Emperor as he breaks free from the thorns eventually is to summon uh, his secret uh, powerful dragon right there and just bombard uh, the Baghdad ship with uh, fire from all sides, effectively <laughs> neutralizing the mobile fortress and they're forced to salvage what they can, escape, and uh, you know recoup uh, Prince Charming uh, will not let that go down so his decision is vital to them winning the war and is taking the last remaining bomb which they got the intel obviously from uh, rescuing Pinocchio and all that stuff so they're going to use that to destroy the final portal if you will so they have to secure that and it's up to uh, Sinbad and Prince Charming to do that but they have to abandon ship. And I do like that they're using the, uh, uh, there we go, the magic robes uh, right there, the magic carpets, I should say, to uh, power the flying fortress as well as uh, pods to escape, right? So they do that, and Charming is obviously horribly wounded and is suffering from intense burns. Meanwhile, uh, back at Fort Bravo, right here, uh, the adversary's army has something really crucial, and it's this magic arrow that is designated to find its target and kill it with very, very strong poisonous magic, and uh, Boy Blue defends right here. Let's see if I can pick that up on the camera. Uh, Bigby, and the two of them get uh, grazed by the arrow and fall unconscious people think they're dead but they're not they're hanging in there barely so we get another freaking badass scene right here this was one of my favorites just seeing the uh, full army and just the diverse creatures and characters that are taking place uh that are taking a part of this battle i should say just look at that stuff i love the art on this book so much uh, so the battle's obviously going to be one-sided, but, you know, if Bigby, who's your uh, commander, basically, is out, you're going to have a ton of trouble. And they're trying to send people back, but obviously they can't because uh, Blue is out of commission as well. And at the same time, you've got the team-up of Sinbad and Prince Charming trying to get that bomb over there. Sadly, they eventually do. Uh, but two things happen. One, Bigby wakes up, and I think it was like three days later or something like that, and he charges uh, to fight and finally take out the Emperor. 
in a really freaking badass scene. I wish we could get this in a movie or animated or something, because I would love to see that in full motion, the, the characters fighting right here. This is so badass. And I love that the Emperor is so huge that to him, <laughs> Bigby's just a regular sized wolf. That's insane. So they're fighting it out, and Bigby uh, loses the first round, but he comes back with the second one with human tools and in his human form to dismantle the Emperor, and he succeeds, so they're able to win. And at the same time, uh, Prince Charming and Sinbad are successful, somewhat, because unfortunately they do set off the bomb, effectively ending the war but at a heavy, heavy uh, cost. I love when stories do this and you can alternate between um, uh, two different scenes at the same time with the different panels back and forth. And Boy Blue is able to wake up and deliver the final blow to the Emperor right there, effectively ending the war, but at a heavy loss because a lot of fables lost their lives in this and the one thing that i really liked about this in the epilogue is that they specify that even though they're fables and they're immortal it also depends on our uh, remembrance of them and the popularity of certain characters uh, boy blue isn't as known uh, well known as big b wolf or mr toad or prince charming snow white stuff like that so when they die the ability for them to be resurrected isn't as powerful as, as other fables and they might just be gone forever so it depend i love that it depends on us as well we're part of the story if you will so unfortunately they uh, uh hold a remembrance for prince charming who i didn't think was going to go out uh, the way he did, but it was inspirational and badass, and he went out like a champ. I mean, it's, damn, you know, talk about the ultimate sacrifice. So, in the epilogue, we find out that the fables have this uh, great idea to take uh, Geppetto, and of course, one of Pinocchio's uh, thing stipulations, I should say for their plan was I'll give you the info you need but you got to secure my dad uh, as a Fable Town resident that is awesome obviously there is going to be a lot of anger about this uh, citizens of Fable Town are not going to be pleased and you see Geppetto as this uh, racist old man dangerous old man who is the cause for such grief and despair uh, you don't really believe it but because uh, you know about the character but you know his backstory in the book and what he's done so a lot of people are really upset and you have another great splash page this is the third one that I really like uh, there's a little bit of gutter loss here but you can make out the scene with everybody watching as he uh, is signing his contract basically at becoming a citizen of Fable Town effectively becoming uh, Part of it and his power is seeming seemingly stripped away right um, uh, yeah so now he has to behave himself and the following issue uh, we get Michael Allred back again and I, I love Allred don't get me wrong but I am NOT a huge fan of him in fables uh, for some reason it just doesn't click for me uh, I mean it looks fine. Allred's super talented. Talented. I love his art so much, but I don't know. It's so different from what I'm used to with this book that it's not. I don't know. Plus, this uh, redesign right here for Pinocchio is it's a little bit jarring because I'm used to the regular version with his smirk and his pouty lip and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know. It's a. It, it's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. It's just vastly different from what we've been reading with uh, Buckingham's art. So you get a life of Geppetto going through a, a day in Fable Town and just being cranky and upset at everything that's happening and his reaction to our uh, the Mundy's world, our world, and all that stuff. 
as a result, uh, you get more planning from the uh, fables and what they're going to do now that effectively you have an empire in shambles, the, the administration's gone, and just like it happens in real life, when you destroy leadership like that, uh, there's going to be chaos and dark times ahead because of it. And as a result, it, we go into something really crucial that will define the rest of the series. That part I do know uh, beforehand. And we get two uh, looter mercenary characters that are trying to, uh, you know, grab anything from the spoils of war. And they find this sacred coffin. Um, they find this sacred coffin, and inside they accidentally release the character who will now be essentially the big bad of Fables, Mr. Dark. And it is a chilling introduction to this creepy character, and it starts to signal the dark times for our beloved characters because the Empire is in shambles. Now that this antagonistic force has awakened, He's trying to claim back all of his magical items and all that stuff, like the witching well or the, the cloak and all that stuff. And you start seeing the effects on that on Fable Town itself as rooms start disappearing, items are no longer there, they're no longer visible, and basically we see the collapse of their society and the incoming danger of such an overlord-type character. I love the idea that even though Geppetto and the Empire and all that stuff, they're bad. They were trying to do good in their own crazy state of mind by uh, keeping all these powerful magical entities locked away, sealed for eternity. And now as a consequence of this rebellion, of this war, that power has been unleashed. And you don't have the powerful Empire now you're going to have to rely on characters that are strong, but aren't necessarily the strongest and are more, they fluctuate a little bit more on that regard. So that's really interesting. And obviously the story is just uh, uh, going to go further uh, and crazier from there. And probably the saddest and most amazing epic thing that happens here um, is, of course, the fact that... Let me get a shot of Mr. Dark here, because, um, right, we're already highlighting all the art. Uh, so here are the two looters. This page was really good, and I got some really cool uh, Mike Miola vibes from this. So, oh, and did I mention, no, I did not, that after the war, uh, Sinbad and Rose Red hooked up. In her moment of, another moment of weakness and despair, she... Uh, basically saw him as the next best thing right and started dating him and eventually got married and previously boy blue tried to tell her about her feelings but she shot him down so it's going to be pretty interesting right here's a great shot uh the uh introduction of mr Sh mr uh, dark right here and he's just an overall creepy bad guy right and boy blue when he returns back he realizes that his arm and his body is not feeling great and it hap uh, they suspected it might have been the arrow when they shot him right so they removed that but the necrosis and sickness is still there so now they believe it's actually the witching cloak uh single thread lodged in the muscle fibers if you will is poisoning him because it's it's the name says it you know it's a witching cloak it's not supposed to be a a good item right of positive energy i guess or positive magic and slowly but surely that is weakening him uh and his body and he loses an arm and the the prognosis is uh pretty terrible uh our boy has very little time left to live and in one of the series' most emotional moments after a vigil is, uh, is uh, after the vigil takes place for uh, the lost fables in the war and Prince Charming, we find out that one of our other beloved characters is also on the brink of death. And 
that was just super emotional. I didn't think I was going to get myself uh, emotionally invested in it, but that was something else, and it really teared me up, that conclusion to his story and his final moments in saying goodbye uh, to all the cast of characters is deeply touching and... I don't know. I was I wasn't in the right state of mind when I was reading it because it made me think about other things in life, in my life, and it, it really teared me up. And it, it was really well done. Uh, here's another uh, fantastic shot of Fable Town being destroyed. Uh, now that you know the dark forces are out there, the hinges and spells and and what's basically keeping Fable Town standing is no longer there so that's ruined and everybody decides to leave for um for the farm which is still standing and pretty secure so everybody's invading the farm now and when they do they find out about um they find out about blue because they have to transport him there because the hospitals aren't going to last as well also, something that I really found interesting is that because of Mr. Dark crossing different dimensions, he's altering the state of being for everything, including uh, Santa Claus and his naughty list, which was really shocking and impressive. That You see his uh, hand right there. He is forced to write out all the bad deeds uh, almost subconsciously, right? And he can't stop. It's... His hand is moving by itself, I guess. So I, that part was a little bit shocking and weird. And yeah, this is what I meant about uh, Blue. And this uh, was pretty emotional, I gotta admit. So we do get our final goodbyes. Yeah, I like that. They try everything from science to magic and nothing works. Even our boy Flycatcher right there. Uh, I thought that was going to be the uh, Hail Mary pass uh, or the Deus Ex Machina element, but it wasn't. And I'm glad it didn't, because otherwise it would have cheapened the moment. Uh, it, it's something that I guess needed to happen for these characters to evolve, because they're immortal, right? And you don't get a lot of quick character progression. So it takes something like this for them to mature and move on and realize, uh, like, shoot, what the heck are we going to do next? And that sort of parallels life, I guess. When we're thrown a wrench into our plans, we don't really know what to do. We just got to keep moving forward and react as things unfold. And, yeah. yeah. Obviously, the characters aren't taking it too well. Uh, Rose Red, in particular, she just realized what she missed and her lost opportunity. And their final conversation is... Uh, pretty fantastic, actually. Uh, I'd love that it wasn't your typical goodbye uh, story element. And Blue, uh, in his final moments, just uh, let her know. Uh, but at the same time, wishing her well in her future endeavors. So now, you know, here we have some more fantastic artwork. Mr. Dark right there. And, of course, uh, Blue passing away. This, this is the part that really got to me. Um, the following morning, everybody's just standing there waiting to see what's going to happen, hoping for the best, but unfortunately it's not to be. And his last request was to be buried in uh, uh, Haven, across the baseball field, where all the uh, practice uh, baseball practices were taking place. So... That was really touching, and this is one of my favorite covers right there. Love that. So after that, we get a brief epilogue of all the characters reacting. We get some more guest artists. This time, um, it's a little bit more cartoony in nature, but uh, at least they look like they're supposed to. Uh, this is from David Hahn uh, right here. No, this is a bad image to highlight. Let me get some close-ups. There we go. Rose uh, is <laughs> divorcing herself from Simbat because of what's happened, and she realized that uh, he just used him as a rebound guy. And 
is uh, not going to have it. So Sinbad leaves. He's got better things to, to do than wallow in that despair, right? <laughs> so, yeah, what soon follows is just the characters, uh, this epilogue to the war, and them reacting and trying to figure out what they're going to do. Obviously, they need to go back to the uh, Empire and secure those lands because you've thrown a kingdom into disarray by uh, effectively cutting off the head of the beast, and now you could plunge them into Dark Ages with war and massacre and all that stuff. So that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, there is a story here with Mowgli going back with Bigby's... Uh, with Bigby's brothers to his homeland to secure that and find out what's happening with the troops and the goblins there. That was pretty fun. And that's about it. It's the final page. So what did I think overall? This is, uh, I still like the Haven story over the war, but this is fantastic. And it's the high peak of the series. And I'm in love with it. I love everything about it and the characters and their journey and all that stuff. And I like that, you know, Willingham is doing parallels between what's happening there and, at least to me, with the struggle of the human condition of life, uh, of problems, death, rebirth, resurrection. All these themes are handled pretty well. And I like the usage of fables and sort of the meta-ness of them being immortal and how they depend on us to sort of keep them going. But there is life beyond death, obviously, and it's not its not final, right? Death isn't final. And in, uh, although it's sad to lose beloved characters, it's great for the story to have Big B and all the other characters realize uh, the nature of war and uh, obviously they were aware going in that stuff like this was going to happen but it forces them to uh, develop and move forward and find solutions and now even though they haven't met Mr. Dark yet they have a really interesting adversary to combat. I know a lot of people uh, don't like the story as much from this point onward but I am uh, on board 100% to check this out and talk about it with you guys. But yeah, uh, aside from the guest artist, the art is fantastic. The action's intense, really well paced, and really interesting. I loved when the war was happening that uh, Boy Blue was sort of our eyes into the whole mess, and you were following him along as he was transporting things and all and doing all that stuff. So yeah, really cool set, action pieces, fantastic art. Just a story that keeps on going full on, uh, <laughs> full on action mode, I guess. Um, I wish, I wish um, Cinderella would have been, uh, would have taken part in the conflict, but obviously she was on Earth, right? And this scene was my favorite of the whole book, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, overall, just a fantastic continuation of a great series. What about you guys? Uh, what do you think about Fables Oversized Hardcover Book 9? Let me know in the comments section down below or the people in the chat. Uh, thank you, uh, Jesse, John, Matt. So thank you for joining. That's awesome. Uh, again, I'm sorry about the whole hiccup at the beginning. Uh, it wasn't the most glamorous way to start a live stream, but hey, I'm still trying to figure things out. <laughs> So that's about it for my review of Fables. Uh, a couple of announcements of the next Fable Fridays will be at the end of November. So around Thanksgiving, that type of thing, I will be doing volumes 10, 11, and 12. And then in December, we're going to do 13, 14, and 15 and wrap up the whole thing. Uh, because I have some really cool ideas in store uh, for 2021. God willing, uh, I plan on doing some really cool live streams on Fridays, effectively canceling uh, the comic book talk and making this a Friday night hangout, if you will, with you guys. We'll go over comics, we'll go over anime, we'll go over manga, Q&A, and I do plan on streaming some things, whether it be some uh, movie content or actual gaming 
it's going to be interesting. I'm really excited about that. Uh, throughout the rest of 2020, I'm going to be doing some uh, stream testing different things. So look forward to that. I'm not really going to announce them because they're tests. I'm just going to stream them. And when I'm done, I'll delete that. So you're not going to be able to see it. But if you do catch me live, jump in and say hi. That always uh, lifts my spirits and it's really awesome. So those are the plans. And next week, look forward to the reviews that you guys voted on. Pluto, Judge's Bizarre Adventure Part 1, and a uh, Halloween-themed video that I'm cooking up uh, for Friday. So, yeah, uh, brief pause on Fable Fridays. We'll be back at the end of November. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. That's it for now. Thank you to the chat for joining, for the people that watched live. And if you didn't watch this live, uh, regardless, thank you so much for watching the video now. <laughs> Uh, thank you for liking, commenting, and if you're new here, please consider subscribing. I do videos like this where I talk about anime, manga, and comics. Uh, that's sort of a week in geekdom in a nutshell. So that's about it, guys. Thank you so much. I've got to go. I will catch all of you on our next video.